is in constant motion, but this wasn't always understood. Our ancestors saw the Earth as an immobile sphere, circled by the planets and stars. Astronomers of the Renaissance brought a new perspective. It wasn't the sky that turned, it was the Earth, joining the other planets in an endless promenade around the sun. But this revelation brought new questions. If the Earth moves, then why does it seem to be motionless? Why aren't we flung into space as it spins beneath us? The answers to such questions would require science to explain the nature of motion itself, both in the heavens and on the Earth. One of the first great thinkers to consider the properties of motion was the philosopher Aristotle in the 4th century BC. Aristotle felt that there were two main kinds of motion. Natural motion, which is when objects seek their natural place according to their weight. In other words, earth is heavier than water, which is heavier than air, which is heavier than fire. And therefore, earth that you lift up, a ball will always fall down, seeking its natural resting place. Then there's violent motion, which is when you take something away from its natural motion by pushing it. If I take the stone and I throw it out the window, then I'm doing something contrary to its nature. And Aristotle thought that what made the stone move was the force of my hand pushing it forward. And when it left my hand, the stone pushes the air in front of it. And then that air in turn rushes around behind the stone and pushes it further so that the air um, eventually uh, exhausts itself and the stone once again resumes its natural motion down. Aristotle's ill-conceived concept of motion lasted almost 2,000 years until Galileo arrived to challenge this venerated authority. On the science of motion, Galileo is really a pivotal figure. You can see how he evolved from the medieval theory of impetus, which he was taught by the Jesuits at the Collegio Romano in the late 16th century, to an early notion of inertia, an inertial motion. Imagine that I have a large, heavy weight in this hand, and I have a light, uh, a smaller weight in this hand, and uh, I drop them at the same time together. <clears throat> Aristotle tells you, Aristotle tells you that the heavier body is going to land first. Galileo, what he discovers through his work with inclined planes is that the two weights, regardless of their differences in size, their color, their texture, their shape, land on the ground together. And that in falling down freely, they accelerate at exactly the same rate. So we have a constant of acceleration. Guess what we just found? In 1971, Apollo astronaut David Scott staged a dramatic recreation of Galileo's famed experiment. While Galileo attempted to explain the motion of objects on Earth, another astronomer, Johannes Kepler, was successfully describing the motions of the planets. Even though Kepler finally got it right, his model not only correctly predicted what the sky would look like, but even correctly described how the planets were actually moving through space. Despite that, even Kepler didn't have a theory in the true scientific sense of the word. There was no way he could explain the motion of the planets in ellipses. Perhaps the planets were animate bodies and just chose their path. But he suggested that they were attracted magnetically to the sun. If the theory becomes extremely useful, and the theory of gravity certainly is, it can be applied to explain the large scale motion of basically everything that takes place in the universe. Because of that, because it's so successful, we elevate it to the status of a law. We speak of the law of gravity. It was not Kepler who did that, nor Galileo, nor Tycho, nor Copernicus, nor Ptolemy, or any of the ancient Greeks. It was Sir Isaac Newton who finally made that important leap forward. Isaac Newton was a very complex man. He probably would go down as one of the 
three leading mathematicians of all time. He did enough in physics, separate, different things, uh, working with the mathematics of motion, of optics, and so on, any one of which would have made his name remembered as one of the great scientists of all time. He was enormously industrious, clearly capable of uh, unusual degrees of concentration, kept uh, uh, scrupulous notes on all of his reading. Newton has available to him, even at the time that he goes up to Cambridge as a young undergraduate in 1661. He has Copernicus's theory, he has Galileo's law of falling bodies, and he has Descartes' principles of uh, philosophy to work with. That is to say, he has resources available to him, uh, which other people do as well, but which he's going to put together in a way that's quite unusual and quite unique. For many, many years, he was a Cartesian. That is to say, he believed the standard textbooks of the day, which described Descartes' scheme of vortices, some kind of ethereal material that was spinning around and was causing the motions of the planets. But as he looked into this more and more carefully, he all of a sudden realized that that wouldn't work mathematically, that one had to have something else going on. What Newton decided was that there was a universal law of gravitation at work. All bodies in the universe exuded this force called gravity. The planets would move around the sun in elliptical orbits by a force that uh, diminished as you went further away from the source of the force of gravity. He found this, and then he didn't do anything about it. Well, down in London, there were these three members of the Royal Society, Robert Hooke, Christopher Wren, and Edmund Halley. Everybody knows about Halley's Comet, but that came later. Uh, they had a discussion about what shape the orbit would be if the sun had that kind of gravitational force. And uh, Robert Hooke said that he, he could prove it, but it would be too easy if he just did it right off. Christopher Wren figured that he couldn't do it. So he offered a prize to whichever one could do it. And Edmund Halley did the smart thing. He went up to Cambridge to ask Isaac Newton what shape the orbit would be. And Newton said, an ellipse. Halley was somewhat surprised and said, how do you know? And Newton said, well, I've calculated it. So Halley began to insist that this should see the light of day. The result of this was that Newton wrote his great book, The Principia. Newton does not tell you, here's how I discovered this and here's how I discovered that. He says, let's start with our axioms and our postulates and our definitions and our laws. And he lays out the principles of the universe. Newton began the Principia with his laws of motion, three fundamental rules which govern the actions of all objects on the earth and beyond. Newton's laws of motion are, since he announced them, sort of fundamental in all of physics. Uh, the first one was that uh, any object which has no forces acting on it will continue either to stay where it is, if it's at rest, or if it's moving, to continue moving in a straight line at a constant speed. Newton's second law now speaks of what happens when there are forces applied that says that if there is a force applied to a mass, then the mass will accelerate, speed up. And the law is that the acceleration of that mass is proportional to the ratio between the force and the mass. Mass and weight are different. Mass is universal. It's all over the universe. The sun has mass. Earth has mass. But you can weigh a mass by seeing how much the force of gravity pulls on it, tends to make it accelerate. The same mass taken to the surface of the moon would weigh different. The third law of, of Newton was something that's sort of obvious. It's for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And the easiest way to think about that is if you're standing face to face with somebody and you poke him so that he tends to fall backwards, you'll tend to fall backwards also. With his three laws of motion, Newton struggled to define more precisely his notion of gravity. 
he showed that a planet going around the sun would be an ellipse. And then all of a sudden he stopped saying this. Why? Because he realizes that there are other planets in the solar system and they would, with their own gravitation, disturb the ellipse so that the ellipse was only a first approximation, but not actually the motion of the planets. In other words, gravitation was universal. Each object attracted every other one. Newton's three laws of motion are sort of fundamental definitions of the way things work, but the law, the other law that he's famous for, the law of gravity is a little bit different. That, that has numbers in it. It has to do with very specific motions. And it says that the gravitational force that one object exerts on another is due to its mass and how far away the other object is. Specifically, the, the square of the distance between this object and that one. But the notion of exactly how the mass fitted into it, this was something Newton put down and on that basis he was able not only to figure out how fast things fall when you drop them to the Earth, but why the moon goes around in its orbit around the Earth, why the planets go in orbit around the sun. One of the very important figures used in describing uh, Newton's laws of gravitation is the one where a projectile is shot off the top of a mountain and it lands to Earth. But if it's shot off with enough force, it keeps going farther and farther until it hits the Earth. And finally, if you shoot it with enough force, by the time the projectile curves and falls down to Earth, the Earth itself has, because of its curved surface, fallen away too and the projectile just continues to fall around the Earth. And this, in essence, explains today what uh, causes satellites to orbit the Earth. Although Newton precisely defined the effects of gravity, he did not explain the causes. With Newton, this mysterious gravitational force seemed almost occult and superstitious. Somehow things were being attracted, planets at a distance, and how could that be? And when pressed, Newton said, concerning gravity, I feign no hypotheses. In other words, he was not going to try to tell you what it was that made gravity work. He was just describing it mathematically. And after that, people sort of stopped asking the question, what is gravity? We can describe it, but it's hard to say what it is. Astronomers, and after Newton, who spent a lot of time looking at planetary behavior, used his laws in a number of ways. One of them was to figure out how heavy Jupiter is, because they could see the moons going around Jupiter, and they could measure about how far away they were and how fast they were going. And using Newton's law of gravity, they could then figure out how much mass Jupiter had in order to make the moons move at that speed at that distance. Everything that Newton touched, he transformed that is to say, he provided ways of thinking about all the problems of motion that had been thought about since antiquity. He provided uh, new ways of thinking about them. Uh, and more than that, he also provided a unified way of thinking about them. That is to say, from a, from a few simple principles, mathematical principles, it was possible to describe all kinds of motions in the world that one saw and that one knew about, and all kinds of motions that one had yet to see. Newton himself believed that he had discovered the divine plan. For over 200 years, astronomers hailed Newton as the supreme authority. Then an unassuming German physicist turned our concepts of motion and gravity inside out. I like a quotation from uh, uh, the late, late Jacob Bronowski, who said that at the end of the last century, it seemed that there were no more great physics problems to be done. And then suddenly, the world came crashing down about our ears. The reason? Because Einstein showed a totally new way of looking at gravitation. Newton's laws of motion describe how things work on Earth very well. But when scientists started developing uh, technologies to look at space, technology to look at much smaller things, atoms and particles like that, Newton's laws break down. They don't work. Newton's laws of motion explained everything, except when electrons started moving at high speed through electric fields, and it didn't work so well. 
instead of throwing them out, there was a German mathematician named Lorentz who said, well, if we, we have this gimmick, what we'll do is we'll figure out that the measurement of lengths and times are changed for things moving at high speed. And if we make our calculations that way, then everything works again. Nobody liked this, because it was a bit of a gimmick. You sort of fool yourself into doing this other calculation. Einstein took that over and said, this is no gimmick. This is a fundamental law of the universe. One of the most remarkable things about Albert Einstein was that he not only gave us theories of physics, but he gave us laws that theories must obey. This is something that almost nobody else has ever given to us. He told us that any theory of physics or any set of uh, physical laws in the universe must have the following property. Suppose that I do an experiment. I do the experiment here in the laboratory, for example, to measure the speed of light. And suppose that I then go and do the same experiment in some other laboratory in a rocket ship, say, moving at a very high speed past the Earth. I do identically the same experiment. I must get identically the same result. So, to Einstein, the laws of physics must be the same everywhere, even for an observer in constant motion. When you say constant motion, you say constant compared to what? You can't say constant compared to the surface of the Earth because the Earth is moving, rotating. If you say constant motion compared to the center of the Earth, well, the Earth's going around the sun. And you can't say constant motion compared to the sun because it's moving around the galaxy and the galaxies are moving around each other. This was what Einstein called the principle of relativity, and it was a principle that must be obeyed by all experiments, all laws of physics that all the laws of physics, the results of all experiments, must be independent of the reference frame in which one performs them, independent of the motion of the laboratory in which one performs them or in which one uh, measure, studies the laws of physics. Einstein took that over and said, this is no gimmick. For every experimenter, the speed of light is the same. That seems like, well, so what? Well, what it means is, if you have two rocket ships approaching each other at very high speed, and one sends out a little pulse of light and measures its speed as it leaves his rocket ship and the other sees the pulse of light coming toward him and the rocket ship's coming toward him too and measures the speed of light, he'll get the same number. How can this be? This rocket ship's going toward him at high speed, then there's speed of light on top of that, and then the speed of this rocket ship going the other way. It should compound itself so the second guy gets a much higher speed. He doesn't. He gets exactly the same speed. That postulate has a tremendously important consequence. The consequence is that the nature of space and the nature of time are completely different from the way that Newton or Galileo or any previous uh, person ever conceived them. Space and time become personal things as a consequence of this postulate. They are dependent on you and your motion. One aspect of that is the famous twins paradox, that if I get in a rocket ship, and I travel at very high speed out into the universe and then return to Earth, and my twin remains on Earth, I will age physically by much less than my twin does. If I carry with myself a high-accuracy atomic clock, it will tick by much less than a twin atomic clock here on Earth. The theory of, of uh, special relativity says that for things that are moving very fast, their clocks should run at a different speed than for us who are looking at them moving very fast. And one example it has to do with a particle called a muon. When a cosmic ray hits the top of the atmosphere and runs in the nucleus of an atom, it often causes a big spray of particles to come out, some of which are muons. And the muons then, many of them, head right down to the surface of the Earth, and they make it, but they shouldn't, because we know how fast they're traveling, and we know what the lifetime of muon is. It falls apart into other particles in a very short time. Supposedly, it doesn't have enough time to get all the way down to the surface of the Earth, and yet it does, because it's going so fast its clock is running slow. So this is a proof of Einstein's theory. Another very important consequence of Einstein's relativity postulate is the equivalence of mass and energy. The fact that mass is merely a particular form of energy. Mass, heat, uh, electric uh, energy, uh, these are all different forms of energy, different forms of the same thing, and they can be converted back and forth one into the other. This, of course, is the foundation for uh, nuclear energy, for the atomic bomb, the hydrogen bomb, for thermonuclear energy generation, uh, uh, generation of electricity uh, in nuclear power plants. 
After he stunned the world of physics with his special theory of relativity, Einstein worked to develop a more general theory that would explain the nature of gravity. The basic principle that Einstein used in developing the general theory, which has to do with accelerating bodies, was this. If you're in a rocket ship and you can't see out the walls, if you have a rocket motor on the rear end that's pushing you along at a force that's equal to the force of gravity, you're accelerating 32 feet per second per second. If you're doing that, or same rocket ship, sitting on the surface of the Earth and not moving, you can't tell the difference because you're being pulled down to the floor by a force equal to the force of gravity, whether it's a rocket motor pushing you or the Earth pulling you down against the surface. Einstein said, okay, since there's no difference, they must be equivalent. So acceleration and gravity have to be somehow equivalent. And the only way he could make them equivalent was to change the geometry of space so that something near a massive body, when it's moving in a straight line, it is actually accelerating. If we accept Einstein's postulate, then we must conclude that somehow those straight lines are obeying not the laws of Euclidean geometry, but the laws of some other kind of geometry. In fact, the geometry of a curved space and a curved time, in fact, in Einstein's language. What Einstein realized then, following this kind of uh, arg argument s similar to this, is that space and time are actually unified into a single four-dimensional entity, which he called space-time. A point in this space-time uh, corresponds to saying where you are in space, that's three dimensions, east, west, north, south, up, down, and when that point occurs in time, so that's four dimensions. With his concept of curved space-time, Einstein went far beyond Newton's simple description of gravity. Newton described the Earth's attraction for the moon as an action at a distance, and in fact, he couldn't explain what that action was. Einstein described gravity as a distortion of space-time. The mass of the Earth curves space-time around it, and the moon responds to that curvature by being accelerated toward the Earth. So Einstein's description of gravity has built into it an explanation for what gravity is, a curvature of space-time. And ultimately, in late 1915, he devised his Einstein field equations, as they are called, is Einstein equations that describe how matter itself curves space-time. The ultimate triumph that told everybody else, all the other physicists, they were all wet and Einstein was right, was the beautiful ability of Einstein's theory, of Einstein's general relativity theory, uh, to explain a peculiar behavior of the orbit of the planet Mercury, which had been a mystery for many decades previously. The orbit of the planet Mercury did not obey Newton's laws. Mercury is in an elliptical orbit, and the elliptical orbit kept shifting a little bit. Every time Mercury went around the sun, the whole orbit shape kept moving along with it, called precession, which is all right. Orbits should precess under the force of gravity of the sun, but it was precessing too much. People did the observations over and over again. Something was wrong with the telescopes or some of their measurements. It wasn't. It was all correct. Nobody could explain it, and Einstein finally explained it with what's called the general theory of relativity. When he first formulated general relativity, Einstein made a prediction for an experiment that he believed should be possible in the near future. He predicted that if light were to travel past the edge of the sun, coming from some distant star, it would appear to us on Earth as though the light was deflected by the sun we, in principle, can see it if we could somehow hide the sun and see the stars behind it. It's exactly what happens when a solar eclipse occurs. The moon goes in front of the sun, blocks out the sunlight, and if there is a light from stars behind the sun bent by the sun's gravity, according to the theory of general relativity, we should see those stars. That was first done in 1919 and uh, supported the idea, the concept, of general relativity to show that at least that test was consistent with general relativity but not with Newton's theory. Somebody came in with a uh, newspaper and said, Professor Einstein, Professor Einstein, they verified that, uh, in f that 
there is a deflection of light around the limb of the sun in agreement with your theory of, ge of general relativity, and the amount agrees. And Einstein did not seem particularly excited, and it is said that uh, one student asked Einstein after class, why aren't you more excited about this? And uh, what, suppose that it had not turned out that way? And Einstein is said to have replied, well, if it had not turned out that way, I would say that's too bad for God. He felt that his general theory of relativity was so compellingly beautiful, so aesthetic, the way that it hung together mathematically and in terms of physical reasoning, that it was hard to imagine how the God that made the universe could possibly have failed to make a universe in which this theory was correct. Over 300 years ago, Sir Isaac Newton explained the motion of the heavens with what he saw as the divine plan. 200 years later, Albert Einstein expanded upon that vision. Today, we continue the quest to better understand and explain the nature of motion and gravity. We think of Einstein and relativity and general relativity as new and, and entirely separate from the old classical physics of Isaac Newton. When in fact, Einstein's description of the universe is a continuation of the development that, that Isaac Newton began. And it may be that someday, in a year or a hundred years, another scientist will see an even better way, a more complete way to describe the universe. We don't pretend to believe that relativity is perfect. We don't pretend to believe that any scientific theory is perfect. We pretend to believe that each theory is better than the one that went before. <laughs>